Let's see. Okay. And here we are. We are in the fourth session. And in fact, before I do anything, let me make sure I have muted everyone. There we go. Okay, we are in the fourth session of six. Whoop, I hit the wrong key already. Uh, it's called Epistemology and the Problem of Consciousness. And epistemology is the branch of philosophy that focuses on uh, how knowledge is acquired. It comes from the Greek word episteme, which means to know. And it's, so it is the study, the logos of, of episteme. So the, the science and the study and the philosophy of, of how humans know things. And the 17th century, as you'll see, is quite a point of inflection on just this issue. And pretty much uh, most of the branches of modern uh, theory about knowing really took their present form in the 17th century. And that's what we'll be talking about. So we'll go to the first slide, which uh, just as sort of a reminder about how disrupted traditional theories about all sorts of things were. There's, there's two main branches as background to what we'll be talking about. Uh, one coming out of the 16th century Reformation and the three great uh, solas of, of Luther and Protestantism, sola scriptura, that scripture is the only authority and that church tradition is a human artifact that is easily dispensed with. Sola gratia, that God's grace is not mediated by a clergy. The individual is the sole arbiter of salvation, so grace alone, uh, which again uh, argues for the dispensing with of the church. And sola fide, we are saved by faith, not works, so that human action has no agency, which uh, bequeathed the kind of passivity on human activity and, and human agency that, that the modern world will bring to the fore as one of the possibilities. Do humans really have agency? Is there free will, etc.? So traditional authority, as you see in the lower left there, has in, in the religious realm has been dispensed with 15 centuries of popes and church councils uh, have created a corrupt political institution that victimizes and exploits the individual Christian, brave new world. Also then, the 17th century scientific revolution. So we see developments that, as we've discussed in astronomy, uh, the earth moving and not as the center of the universe, uh, breakthroughs in physics, there's an unseen force, gravity that explains the motion of bodies. Uh, it's being unseen is, is the keynote here because it disrupts our sense of common sense. Uh, biological breakthroughs, there are microbes, we have the microscope now, and, and these can't be perceived by the naked eye. So they're there's this animal kingdom and, and botanical kingdom that can't be observed except uh, through specialized instruments. And of course, uh, the central role of mathematics. The universe seems to obey mathematical laws, and these are incredibly abstract and not easily understood. So again, traditional authority is misplaced. A reliance on Aristotle and Ptolemy has created a system that defies empirical observations. Those empirical observations belie the old theories. Common sense has been proven wrong, and certainty is at best a fragile and incongruous commodity. So uh, the spirit of the age is that the world is, is, has been rendered topsy-turvy. Now, Traditional epistemology, just a very quick overview to put us back in the frame before we get to our new guys. Uh, the major players 
uh, position one Platonism or its offshoots Neoplatonism and Augustinianism. The argument is that there is an objective reality out there and that this reality is arranged as a hierarchy from separately existing higher forms. So the higher forms, the ideas of things are real and they're prior to the physical examples that copy or imitate them. So this, this reality goes from higher forms to lower particular objects that exist merely as imperfect copies. Sensory perception, of course, which picks up from the imperfect copies, is limited as a result and imperfect. True knowledge is formal. It's about the forms. When you understand what something really is in its essence, it's not the physical thing you pick that up from. It's the idea that was there, perhaps even as an innate idea that was triggered by the sensory experience of the physical thing. Uh, Fido and Gemma and Daisy are th those real dogs. They are not the idea dog. They are imperfect copies of the principle. Just like all the instances of the number two you see are, are but pale copies of, of two-ness in and of itself. So if we look at the diagram on the upper right, on the left side of that diagram, the platonic uh, worldview. So we have the world of matter, things. We get these apples out there at the bottom, as you see. And, and they are imitations of this idea apple, appleness, the, the, the apple par excellence, if it will. It's the idea of the apple that, that knowledge is about. It's the ideal of the apple that reality is about for Plato, because these ideas are real. In fact, they are, if, if, if I can make a comparative out of it, they are real-er. They are more real than the physical objects. Aristotle and his follower, Thomas Aquinas, take another position. He agrees there is an objective reality. There is real stuff out there. But the real objects are both form and matter. So forms exist, but they don't have a separate existence from the physical stuff. They're embedded in them. So if you look at the Aristotle um, image on the right side of that upper diagram, the world of form and matter. So you see form and matter are both aspects of things, the, the two different circles, the red circle and the green circle. Whereas on the left, the world of things was separate from uh, the realm in, in the, the red up on the top of, of uh, the forms. So for Aristotle, sensory perception is the ultimate source of all knowledge. You can't, you can't know the forms without having looked at the things. The forms or universals, as, as, as they come to be known during the Middle Ages, are known by abstracting concepts from raw perceptions. So the eye is stimulated by the image of, of Gemma and Daisy and the, the dogs that are running around and, and somehow we abstract the concept dog from the objects. So Aristotle would say, look at the way a child, uh, a toddler, who's just learned how to speak, you keep on pointing out dogs to the toddler and saying, this is Gemma, uh, th this is Daisy, this is Rosie. And, and you're using specific names of specific particular dogs. But at some point, the child makes this leap to the abstraction and gets the idea that they all have something in common and that they are all dogs. They, they make this leap to the, to the universal, to the abstract concept. And in Plato's theory, 
it means the idea was there and it got triggered by some kind of a leap. And Aristotle's theory, uh, there was an act in the mind of abstraction that took place somehow, but to some degree mysteriously, but the, but the abstraction lifted the idea from the thing. So in the mind, so the mind can really know reality by knowing the form that is embedded in the thing. So, and, and even higher forms for Aristotle are known through deduction, through logical processes. Then there is um, the great medieval contribution, nominalism, uh, which from the word nomina, which means names. And they would suggest, yes, there is an objective reality, but universals are not real. Those abstract concepts are linguistic or intellectual constructs. So dog is a name that we come up with. Now, for the absolute nominalist, the image on in the lower diagram on the left, uh, you use the word dog, I use the word dog, you use the word apple, I use the word apple, but I might actually have the image of a banana, and you might have the image of an apple, and we don't really know how la- even weather language is working at this level. So, but there are some nominalists that are what are called conceptualists or moderate realists. They maintain that general ideas have conceptual significance and that they group objects with common traits. So you could argue that Aristotle is to some degree a conceptualist. So I have, I use the word apple. I have the idea apple. You use the word apple. You have the idea apple. And, and, we, we have faith that uh, when each of us uses the term, we are referring to a real concept that describes things accurately. Or else, in an absolute nominalist position, we don't even know whether we can talk about reality because we don't know that we're naming the same things. And we don't know whether there's a true alter egoism, whether I can assume that you see things the way I see things. Anyhow, that is sort of the the thumbnail sketch of the traditional groupings of epistemological theory coming into the 17th century. And and some of our people in the 17th century will use some of uh, the same uh, armory. So, and the movement to science, it's had an impact on epistemological theory. Uh, If we look back at scholastic philosophy first, remember the method of the schoolmen, the lecturers and, and disputants in the universities was disputation, the structured arguments over, over theses that were nailed to the door like Martin Luther's theses. Theories of reality were formally argued and judged by academic committees. Proofs involved strings of deductions from first principles themselves, usually unprovable assumptions. Thomas regarded being the ultimate abstraction as the target of metaphysics. God, who is pure being, could be known in terms of what he or she was not, only was not. And that the the goal of philosophy was to understand underlying uh, reality fundamentally. Let's not mess around with the surfaces of things. Let's let's get to the meat of it. Let's see if we can try to say something about God and being. Uh, Of course, skepticism was often a response to the traditional theories. Centuries of philosophical speculation had not resolved core metaphysical issues. There were schools of thought that despaired of ever arriving at satisfactory answers. And then along came the 17th century with the new science, the Scienza Nuova, as the Italians called it. And 17th 
century scientific investigation produces results, answers to a host of practical questions and problems. And that's uh, one of the, the angles that I, I and themes that I was trying to stress over the, the last couple of lectures in this series. It doesn't deny the ultimate questions about why and what fundamental reality, is there a God? What is the God intent? By and large, what the new science does is ignores them. It doesn't deny them, it ignores them. It just starts answering different questions. And those questions are a bunch of how-tos. Those questions are as different from is there a God as, as possibly could be. They have more to do with how does a carburetor work than they do with, with ultimate questions of why. So science's methods and procedures are instrumental. It seeks to know how something works. It replaces the philosopher and the theologian with the engineer and the mathematician. Let's build a bridge. Science's questions are amenable to answers. The focus has shifted from final cause to efficient cause or by its other name, agent cause. How does this gizmo work? Why do the planets move in elliptical orbits? So philosophy in the age of science and disruption becomes less an interest uh, of metaphysics, what is, and more an interest of epistemology. How do we know? How does this, how does this thing, this process of our coming to know something, how do we know that what we know? How do we know that we know? How does that whole thing work? As with experimental science, philosophy turns to questions of method and certainty. Well, how can I be sure about what I know? And so the first uh, great theoretical attempt, and this is the famous attempt of René Descartes, and I use that painting of Franz Hals, and they believe it's a copy, by the way, that, and I think it's in the Louvre. Descartes, we've talked about him before in relation to his contributions to mathematics, but now we want to talk about his, his great contribution to rationalist philosophy, and we'll see what we mean by that. So he lives only in the first half of the century. He's born in 1596, and he makes it to mid-century, as was the case with nearly every intellectual giant of the 17th century, Descartes was deeply religious. It isn't that they were denying religion, but he was bothered by the tumult of the wars of religion. Remember, he's, he's living on the continent in the age of the catastrophic 30 years war, 1618 to 1648. And I have something uh, to say about this in the next session, actually. Uh, so his, his life experience overlaps head on with the overflow, the, the, the flotsam that flowed out of the 30 years war and religious wars in general. His philosophy embodies the characteristic sentiments of his time. He wants to address the crisis of faith caused by religious upheaval that we talked about in the first slide. He wants to achieve the certainty of mathematics and the new scientific approach. He is a mathematician. And he wants to reform and simplify the fruitless methods of the scholastics by which they just ran around in circles chasing their own tails, doing deductions that led to further deductions, but no resolutions. So he wrote his famous Discourse on Method in 1637, he published it in 1637, uh, modeling his philosophical approach on geometric proofs, on the mathematical style proofs of analytic geometry. He describes his method as based upon four principles, and he, these are quotes from the Discourse on Method, from the uh, prologue to it. 
a one. The first was never to accept anything for true, which I did not clearly know to be such. That is to say, carefully to avoid precipitancy and prejudice and to comprise nothing more in my judgment than what was presented to my mind so clearly and distinctly as to exclude all ground of doubt. Second, to divide each of the difficulties under examination into as many parts as possible and as might be necessary for its adequate solution. Baby steps, huh? Third, to conduct my thoughts in such order that by commencing with objects the simplest and easiest to know, I might ascend little by little geometric proofs and as it were step by step to the knowledge of the more complex, assigning in thought a certain order even to those objects which in their own nature do not stand in a relation of antecedents and sequence. And last, in every case to make enumeration so complete and review so general that I might be assured that nothing was omitted. Okay, now the following quotes are, are going to come from either his Discourse on Method or his famous Meditations on First Philosophy, which was published in 1642. And, and the first few I'm looking at are going to deal with uh, this methodological skepticism. He's going to start from a principle of skepticism and he and using that principle is going to reject sensory perception as dubious. So the first selection, to achieve a foundation of disciplined, systematic skepticism, Descartes doubts sense data. He's not going to trust sense data. A good geometer, a good mathematician would not trust sense data. Accordingly, seeing that our senses sometimes deceive us, I was willing to suppose that there existed nothing really such as they presented to us. And because some men err in reasoning and fall into paralogisms, fallacious reasoning, even on the simplest matters of geometry, I convinced that I was as open to error as any other, rejected as false all the reasoning I had hitherto taken for demonstrations. And finally, when I consider that the very same thoughts which we experience when awake may also be experienced when we are asleep, while there is at that time not one of them true, dreams, I, which look very real to the dreamer, I suppose that all the objects that had ever entered into my mind when awake had in them no more truth than the illusion of my dreams. So let's assume that everything I think I know through the senses is dreamlike, is a misrepresentation. The principal error consists in my judging that the ideas which are in me are similar or conformable to the things which are outside me. One of the assumptions people make is, oh, yeah, I know what a dog is. Just like they say, oh, yeah, I know that the earth doesn't move or that it's the center of the universe. It's, it's the fundamental error, the principal error, he calls it, is that you think that the out there corresponds to uh, the superficial ideas that you have in here inside the mind. But there's one thing that is not in doubt, he says. The act of thinking is not in doubt. But immediately upon this, I observed that whilst I thus wished to think that all was false, it was absolutely necessary that I, who thus thought, should be somewhat. And as I observed that this truth, I think therefore I am, the cogito ergo sum, the famous statement, was so certain and of such evidence that no ground of doubt, however extravagant, could be alleged by this skeptics capable of shaking it. I concluded that I might, without scruple, accept it as the first principle of philosophy of which I was in search. In another place, he says, substitute for think the word doubt. 
I mean, the fact is, my thoughts could be wrong, but the fact that I'm having them could not be doubted, he claims. And so, and so here is a starting point. I know I am thinking. It may all be wrong, but I know that I am thinking. I don't quite believe what I am thinking, but I know that I am thinking. So he, it's his starting point. And then he introduces the, the uh, famous mind-body dualism, that the mind and the body are separate and distinct. He calls the mind the res cogitans, the thinking thing. And the body, the res extensa, the thing that occupies space, the material thing. So he wants to argue that mind is not extended. It does not exist in material form. So the mind and body are separate and distinct. In the next place, I attentively examined what I was. And as I observed that, I could suppose that I had no body. Okay, I'll make believe that what I think is my body is actually an illusion. And that there was no world nor any place in which I might be, but that I could not therefore suppose that I was not. And that on the contrary, from the very circumstance that I thought to doubt of the truth of other things, it most clearly and certainly followed that I was. I mean, the fact is, well, my mind is still there thinking, and of that I am certain. While on the other hand, if I had only ceased to think, although all the other objects which I had ever imagined had been in reality existent, I would have had no reason to believe that I existed. But that isn't the case. I thence concluded that I was a substance whose whole essence or nature consists only in thinking, and which, that it may exist, has need of no place, nor is dependent on any material thing, so that I, that is to say, the mind by which I am what I am, is wholly distinct from the body, and is even more easily known than the latter, and is such that although the latter were not, it would still continue to be all that it is. So everything else that's appeared, mind is still here. He's turned the philosophical enterprise upside down. His, as his starting point, I don't know what is out there. I only know that there is an in here. He's inverted the approach. Mind, next point, mind has no spatial extension, which is going to lead him to a theory of the immortality of the soul. Let's see how this begins to work. We cannot conceive of body excepting insofar as it is divisible. Okay, it's got extension. You can divide extension. Well, the mind cannot be conceived of accepting as indivisible, only as indivisible. You can't divide up the mind. For we are not able to conceive of the half of a mind as we can do of the smallest of all bodies. So that we see that not only are their natures different, but even in some respects contrary to one another. I have not, however, dealt further with this matter in this treatise, both because what I have said is sufficient to show clearly enough that the extinction of the mind does not follow from the corruption of the body. The body dies. That doesn't mean the mind does. And also to give men the hope of another life after death, as also because the premises from which the immortality of the soul may be deduced depend on an elucidation of a complete system of physics. We'll see what he means by this. So he's going to intimate that the soul is immortal. As to the issue of body-mind connectedness, so he's going to make the point, although distinct, mind and body are somehow closely connected. Because, well, you see what he says, but the internal experience is that, hey, I seem, I seem to think my 
mind is housed in this thing that I refer to as my body. So what, what gives? Nature also teaches me by the sensations of pain, hunger, thirst, and so on. They am not merely present in my body as a pilot in his ship, but that I am very closely joined and as it were intermingled with it so that I and the body form a unit. So somehow I am connected to this body. If this were not so, I who am nothing but a thinking thing would not feel pain when the body was hurt, but would perceive the damage purely by the intellect, just as a sailor perceives by sight if anything in his ship is broken. And we're gonna see something about his theory of this. And then he's going to introduce a concept that is very much like Plato. He is going to argue for innate ideas, ideas that are built into the mind. He's going to sound like St. Augustine. He's going to sound like Plato. He's going to sound like the Neoplatonists. Innate ideas forms are those that originate in the mind or the the thinking thing, as he calls it. Some ideas appear to me to be innate, some adventitious, which means uh, not necessary. Adventitious is um, something that is contingent, doesn't have to be, and others to be formed or invented by myself. So there, there are three categories of ideas for him. The innate ideas, some that are just contingent and not necessary, and some that he seems to have made up, like dreams. For as I have the power of understanding what is called a thing or a truth or a thought, and it appears to me that I hold this power from no other source than my own nature. He moves on. The mind is not the source of innate ideas. There must be a God, and the idea of God is innate. If the objective reality of any of my ideas makes me recognize that it is not in me either formally or eminently, okay, this is a hard idea. So he says, if, if any of the ideas, any of, the, of my fundamental ideas are in me but aren't part of my nature to have them, they're, they're not built into me the way, uh, they're not formally necessary. A circle is formally a circle. It can't be a square. But a human didn't have to have this idea, he, he's suggesting. And then I cannot myself be the cause of it. It follows of necessity that I am not alone in the world, but that there is another being which is the cause of this idea. This is sometimes called the ontological argument. And it actually goes back to the Middle Ages and St. Anselm, um, who essentially argued that the idea of God, the idea of that in which no greater can be conceived must exist because the idea could not have just been invented by me. It only remains to examine into the manner of which I have acquired this idea from God. For I have not received it through the senses, for it is not in my power to take from or add anything to it. It's the idea of perfection, the idea of the ideal. And consequently, the all only alternative is that I was born with it. It is innate in me, just as the idea of myself is innate in me. So very early in his sort of geometric reasoning, he postulates that there are ideas that are innate, that can't come from him natively, and therefore suggest the existence of a God. And he will later go on, even though I'm not going to show it here, he will later go on to then say, uh, the idea of this God as good is a necessary idea. And, and therefore, my trusting ultimately in the senses is readmitted through a back door. And the back door is God wouldn't be tricking me. The good God, the idea of the good God that I have 
as an innate idea, is not a God who can trick me. And therefore, uh, the only way I know to trust sense data at all for him is because he has rationally concluded from what he he can know analytically that he that he's a thinking thing, that he has some innate ideas built in, and that there must be an external source of these innate ideas, which is God, and that that, that God would not be a trickster God. And, and so he, he, he rationally comes to a grudging uh, trust of sorts in sense data, but not in and of themselves as, as they exist, because, they, because there's, no, there's nothing about perception that suggests in and of itself that it has to be true. So what we have in Descartes is this revolution and epistemology. It's a paradigm shift from object, the out there, to subject, the in here. Traditional epistemology had proceeded from the assumption that the objective world, the out there, was known with some, excuse me, with some certainty, and the question was explaining how we knew it. Descartes turns the assumption on its head and assumes that certainty accrues only to the subjective world, the in here. Philosophy is to be done inside out. And as was the case with Plato, the model becomes mathematics. The model is not empirical science. It's not lab science for him. The model of how you go about arguing cases and knowing things is mathematical. The mind-body split, the seed of knowing for him is in an immaterial mind, while the seed of sensation is in the material body. So for Descartes, they're connected, but explaining how is going to be a huge problem for philosophy going forward. If you look at this little picture, this little diagram in, in the upper right, he actually argues that uh, the sensory organs pass stimuli to the pineal gland at the base of the brain and from there to the mind. So he wanted to argue that there was this sort of magical point at which sensory organs pass stimuli to a part of the brain that somehow interfaced with mind whatever that was supposed to be and however that was supposed to be. So the question of whether consciousness is simply brain activity, which would be body or something else, mind, begins with Descartes and continues into the age, the present age of uh, artificial intelligence and the great debate of whether machines which we don't think of as having mind, could be thought to truly think. Is general artificial, general AI, general artificial intelligence possible? Or, or is artificial intelligence going to be restricted to what they call narrow artificial intelligence, which is basically... Uh, coding for every exigency in a narrowly defined field. The question remains in computer science. So people argue both sides of this. Those who believe, for instance, that, that it is the brain thinking, uh, if that is the case, there is no reason why machines will not overtake us in the arenas of general artificial intelligence. And, and that's something that feels like thought, that feels like consciousness, is something that you will be able to buy from Dell or Hewlett Packard somewhere down the line. Or maybe Elon Musk and Tesla, who knows where it's going to, where it's going to come from. Um, so the ancillary modern question of whether the activity of the brain as machine is physically determined, that is, 
whether there is free will is also going to derive from uh, this Cartesian split. So there is this other extremely pertinent secondary question. If indeed thought is the result of the activity of a material object, the brain, then, then if it's so many electrons firing across synapses and the like, then is it somehow uh, deterministic? What, what is free will in, in such a world? Will become the modern question. Now, out of Descartes, and you notice that I titled the slide Cartesian Rationalism and the Continent. So this is going to be this century. We, we, we're just looking at the first half of it now. This century is going to be the point at which two great rival approaches to broad philosophical questions originate. Uh, these two approaches, one of which is rationalist with, with something, something suggesting mathematical models at root and takes a great root in continental Europe. It becomes part of the uh, German, French, Italian, um, et cetera, tradition. And it's going to be very distinct from the flavor, which we will look at after this, of the Anglo-American or English language traditions. So rationalist epistemology, if you look at this box at the bottom of the slide, which I've called the, the continental tradition, Descartes influenced much of what follows, followed in continental philosophy. Sensory experience is downplayed in favor of an analysis of mind or innate ideas of some kind or deep-seated mental structures inbuilt to the mind. So whether it's Leibniz or Baruch Spinoza in, in the 17th century or Immanuel Kant in the late 17th into, into the 18th, century, um, excuse me, the late 18th century, or GWF Hegel into the beginnings of the 19th century, idealists, phenomenologists, structuralists, post-structuralists are all heirs of the tradition. Uh, the traditions that look for language learning as built into the brain in terms of deep-seated structures, or proceed from, for instance, Ferdinand de Saussure, the, the, the great founder of modern linguistics, Durkheim and his sociological theories and anthropological theories, looking for deep-seated uh, social structures, Claude Lévi-Strauss and, and his um, structuralism as he examines uh, so-called primitive societies. The phenomenologists and existentialists like Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, all sort of rooted in the Kantian tradition of asking how uh, the mind's deep structures are frameworks for the reality as we experience it. Uh, Kant is going to have, and an, an, an later thought is going to have a huge presence because he's going to ask, okay, if I've got all, all these perceptions in mind, aren't there, aren't there categories that all the perceptions have to fit in that I can, I can deduce or intuit from the perceptions? It's as if he's looking at it's as if he's looking at film, movie film, and saying, isn't there something in the nature of the structure of movie film itself that'll explain to me why I see it the way I see it, et cetera. And so deep in the continental tradition, whether it's examining how 
political science works and societies work, or how language works, or how perception works, uh, or generally speaking, how the mind works, uh, or how history works. Out of Hegel, we're going to get from Hegel flipped on his head, Karl Marx, and looking for structures in history itself that explain why the bourgeoisie had to come to exist at a certain point in history because of what's happened materially in the world and how uh, socialism is a structure thrown up by history as necessary. So that, that continental tradition of looking deep inside of things to try to explain reality is born in this Cartesian rationalism that first says you have to look at mind and the structures of the mind to understand what the out there is. Anyhow, and then there's the other side of the coin. So let's turn to the model of philosophical empiricism and, and its really great founder. And we've talked about him before, and we're going to talk about him a lot um, next class also on another topic, though, is John Locke, who is a generation and a half or so uh, younger than Descartes. And, and Locke had an immense influence in two completely different arenas, socio-political theory as the father of modern liberalism, and that's what we're going to look at next time, and epistemology as the father of British empiricism. His book, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, published in 1689, was a deliberate refutation of Cartesian rationalism and the first salvo in a philosophical approach that will culminate in David Hume's radical empiricism in the 18th century enlightenment. So uh, these quotes are going to come from uh, an essay concerning human understanding. I have a little picture of Locke. I used a different one than, than the one I, I used earlier in, in these classes showing different portraiture. In book one, he dives head on into his objections to Descartes. And he attacks first the whole idea of innate notions, that there are, that there are ideas built into the mind that can't be explained as coming from outside the mind. I hope that this inquiry, first of all, his argument is going to be, let's, let's accept our own limitations. Let's not be so global and, and, and try to answer these large and daunting questions. I hope that this inquiry into the nature of, under, of the understanding will enable me to discover what its powers are, how far they reach, what things they are adequate to deal with, and where they fail us. If I succeed, that may have the effect of persuading the busy mind of man to be more cautious in meddling with things that are beyond its power to understand, to stop when it is at the extreme end of its tether, and to be peacefully reconciled to ignorance of things that are beyond the reach of our capacities. So it's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the great first salvo of, of British sub philosophical sobriety. Let's pull there before we our horses run away with the stagecoach. Perhaps then we shall stop pretending that we know everything and shall be less bold in raising questions and getting into confusing disputes with others about things to which our understandings are not suited, things of which we can't form any clear or distinct perceptions in our minds, or as happens all too often, things of which we have no notions at all. If we can find out what the scope of the understanding is, how far it is able to achieve certainty, and in what cases it can only judge and guess, that may teach us to accept our limitations and to rest content 
with knowing only what our human condition enables us to know. Let's take it slow, guys. Book one, again, still on the topic of innate notions. First point, the innate notions are not necessary for knowledge. Some people regard it as settled that there are in the understanding certain innate principles. These are conceived as primary notions, letters printed on the mind of man, so to speak, which the soul, mind, receives when it first comes into existence and that it brings into the world with it. I could show any fair-minded reader that this is wrong. If I could show, as I hope to do so in the present work, how men can get all the knowledge they have and can arrive at certainty about some things, some things, purely by using their natural faculties without help from any innate notions or principles. Even if it were in fact true that all mankind agreed in accepting certain truths, like one of the arguments for innate ideas is that everybody agrees from all cultures on certain things. Uh, that, and he points out, even if they did all agree on certain things, that wouldn't prove them to be innate. If universal agreement could be explained in some other way, and I think I can. And then he goes on to argue. And his first example is that of the so-called tabula rasa, the blank slate, the white paper and experience. Let us then suppose the mind to have no ideas in it. Let's start with the mind doesn't know anything. To be like white paper with nothing written on it. How then does it come to be written on? From where does it get that vast store which the busy and boundless imagination of man has painted on it? All the materials of reason and knowledge. To this I answer in one word, from experience. Our understandings derive all the materials of thinking from observations that we make of external objects that can be perceived through the senses and of the internal operations of our minds, which we perceive by looking in at ourselves. These two are the fountains of knowledge from which arise all the ideas we have or can naturally have. And he then goes on to describe what, I, what he calls ideas. And he says there are two types. There are ideas from sensation. First, our senses, when applied to particular perceptible objects, convey into the mind many distinct perceptions of things according to the different ways in which the objects affect them. That is how we come by those ideas we have of yellow, white, heat, cold, soft, hard, bitter, sweet, and all those that we call sensible qualities. When I say that the senses convey these ideas into the mind, I don't mean this strictly and literally, because I don't mean to say that an idea actually travels across from the perceived object to the person's mind. Rather, I mean that through the senses, external objects convey into the mind something that produces there those perceptions. This great source of most of the ideas we have, I call sensation. Ideas from the operations of the mind. Secondly, the other fountain from which experience provides ideas to the understanding is the perception of the operations of our own mind within us. This yields ideas that could be had from external things, ones such as the ideas of perception, thinking, doubting, believing, reasoning, knowing, willing, and all the different things that our minds do. Being conscious of these actions of the mind, and observing them in ourselves, our understandings get from them ideas that are as distinct as the ones we get from bodies affecting our senses. Every man has this source of ideas wholly within himself, 
And although it is not sense, because it has nothing to do with external objects, it is still very like sense. But along with calling the other sensation, I call this reflection. So that is my thesis. All our, our ideas take their beginnings from these two sources, external material things as objects of sensation and the operations of our own minds as objects of reflection. Still talking about the idea of ideas. Children learn, he argues, incrementally. If you look carefully at the state of a newborn child, you will find little reason to think that he is well stocked with ideas that are the matter of his future knowledge. He gets ideas gradually. And though the ideas of obvious and familiar qualities imprint themselves before the memory begins to keep a record of when or how, ideas of unusual qualities are different. Some of them come so late that most people can remember when they first had them. And if we had to reason to, we could arrange for a child to be brought up in such a way as to have very few ideas, even ordinary ones, until he had grown to manhood. Having ideas means having perceptions. When does a man first have ideas? That is the same as asking, when does a man begin to perceive? For having ideas and perceptions are the same thing. It goes on again. Thinking is not essential. Let's see what he means. I don't think that it is any more necessary for the soul always to think than for the body always to move. In my view, the perception of ideas is to the soul as motion is to the body, not something that is essential to it. So he's arguing against Descartes again here. But sometimes that it's some, but something that it sometimes does. So even if thinking is an activity that is uniquely appropriate to the soul, that doesn't require us to suppose that the soul is always thinking, always in action. To say that experience is irrelevant because actual thinking is essential to the soul and thus conceptually inseparable from it is to assume the very thing that is in question. Such a claim needs to be supported by arguments unless the claim is a self-evident proposition. I, I want to point out before I leave this slide that, of course, many modern linguists believe that Language, for instance, while there is aspects of it that is learned that is learned incrementally, there are deep seated bootstrapping structures that um, yield language before it could be accounted for on any trial and error basis, so that. Uh, people like Noam Chomsky will point out that young, still babies, really, toddlers, have uh, are able to achieve sentence structure of sorts that you cannot account for by, by internalizing incrementally over um, time, as if it were purely a tabula rasa. So indeed, there are going to be moderns who are going to think in terms of both um, Platonic rationalism and uh, Lockean or English empiricism simultaneously, as, as we will see, hopefully. Simple ideas are singular and irreducible. So the qualities that affect our senses are intimately united and blended in the things themselves. That it is obvious that the ideas they produce in the mind enter via the senses, simple and unmixed. A single sense will often take in 
different ideas from one object at one time. As when a man sees motion and color together, or the hand feels softness and warmth in a single piece of wax. And yet the simple ideas that are thus brought together in a single mind are as perfectly distinct as those that come in by different senses. The coldness and hardness a man feels in a piece of ice are distinct ideas in the mind as the smell and whiteness of a lily or the taste of sugar and the smell of a rose. And nothing can be plainer to a man than the clear and distinct perception he has of those simple ideas, each of which contains nothing but one uniform appearance or conception in the mind, and it's not distinguishable into different ideas, so that there are these ultimate simples in perception out of which everything is going to get constructed in the mind, is, is the way his argument is tending. Now, complex ideas, as he then pushes the argument in different directions, these simple ideas, which are the materials of all our knowledge, are suggested and supplied to the mind only by sensation and reflection. Once the understanding has been stocked with these simple ideas, it is able to repeat, compare, and unite them to an almost infinite variety, and so can make new complex ideas as it will. But no one, however quick and clever, can invent one new simple idea that was not taken in by one of those two ways, either by raw sensation or primitive reflection on sensation. So simple ideas are irreducible. Complex ideas are combinations of simple ideas for him. Complex ideas suggest substance. The idea that there is a substrate that unifies a cluster of ideas or perceptions, he wants to argue. The mind notices that a certain number of these simple ideas go constantly together and presumes them to belong to one thing. And because words are suited to ordinary ways of thinking and are used for speed and con convenience, those ideas, when united in one subject, are called by one name. Then we carelessly talk as though we had here one simple idea, though really it is a complication of many ideas together. What has happened in such a case is that because we can't imagine how these simple ideas could exist by themselves, we have acquired the habit of assuming that they exist in and result from some substratum, which we call substance. Our idea of dog. It's furry. It has, it has temperature like an animal. Uh, it has a face like other animals. From this, we move on to having ideas of various sorts of substances, which we form by collecting combinations of simple ideas that we find in our experience tend to go together, and which we therefore suppose to flow from the particular internal constitution or unknown essence of a substance. Thus, we have come to the ideas of a man or gold water. Each of our ideas is of a specific kind of substances is nothing but a collection of simple ideas considered as unified in one thing. Now, this raises an interesting question. So we, we postulate that all the, these simple perceptions that form ideas, simple ideas, that we put together to yield the idea of a horse we, we posit that there is a substrate, a horse, horseness underneath it. And, and of course, this, the, the more radical expressions of this form of empiricism are going to be hard pressed to explain what that 
unifying substrate is, or if, as is the case with David Hume, who takes it to a wildly radical extreme, that there even is this unity underneath it. He's going to start arguing that we have bundles of impressions and, and that, you know, the bundle is itself a perception, uh, that there doesn't have to be something that is truly knowable beyond, beyond that bundle of perceptual qualities, perceived qualities. We know little of, and I'm introducing a, a term used in, by Kant later on, we know little of things in themselves, the ding an sich, the thing in itself. The assumption that there is this realm of reality below the phenomena, which caused the phenomena. And, and, and Locke is going to in, introduce this as a problem. How do we get how do we get from the surface perceptions to knowing something about things in themselves? And he's gonna he's going to suggest right here we may not get very far, whatever. The secret, abstract nature of substance in general may be. All our ideas of particular sorts of substances are nothing but combinations of simple ideas coexisting and some unknown cause of their union. We may, we may be at a disadvantage and knowing what the world is, the out there is in itself. We may not be able to get there. We may be locked into a critique of the surface perceptions of things. And then he adds on, but it seems that God didn't intend that we should have a perfect clear and adequate knowledge of things, and perhaps no finite being can have such knowledge. Our faculties are dull and weak, he suggests. Language. In book two of an essay concerning human understanding, he talks about words. He says, words signify ideas, but they are assumed to signify reality. But that, that is an assumption. Word, and he says, words can properly and immediately signify nothing but ideas in the mind of the speaker. When you and I speak, remember that little cartoon that I pointed to that, and that at the, on the second or third slide this afternoon of two people talking, and they each have thought bubbles. Words can properly and immediately signify nothing but ideas in the mind of the speaker. When I use a word, I'm referring, my, the referent for that, this, the signifier for that is something in my mind, which might not exactly be what is in your mind. Men suppose their words to be marks also of ideas in the mind of the hearer. It, they suppose, he says, men don't often pause to consider whether their ideas are the same as those of the hearers. A man wants his hearers to think he is talking not merely about his own imagination, but about things as they really, really are. He will often suppose his words to stand not just for his ideas, but also for the reality of things. And what's the suggestion here? But they may not. But they may not. So again, we have seen the other side of the 17th century coin. And again, it's a revolution in epistemology. Objectivity versus subjectivity. For Locke, sense perceptions are what the mind knows. And these arise from accidental qualities that inhere in things. Whiteness, coldness, 
fabric textures. Without the device of innate ideas, Locke has no way to ensure that we can objectively know the external world or even share the same ideas through language. He and Descartes both ultimately rely on the belief that God would not deceive us. And again, there is a mind-body split, as there was with Descartes. Locke cannot resolve the problem of where thinking resides. And he says, we have the ideas of matter and of thinking, but possibly shall never be able to know whether any material being thinks. Or no, it being impossible for us by the contemplation of our own ideas without revelation, without God's revelation, to discover, to discover whether God has not given to some system of matter a.k.a. the brain, fitly disposed, a power to perceive and think, or else joined to matter, so disposed, a thinking immaterial substance. So, the brain of a dog, the, the brain of Gemma. Uh, traditionally, people would have spoken of the question, do dogs have souls? No, they don't. Therefore, they don't think the same way we do, or they're not capable of real thought as, as we know it, because that is something that has been given to the soul by God. Or is it the brain that's thinking, in which case the brain of Gemma, the dog, is doing something perhaps at a, uh, a lower level of complexity but something that is definitely of the same ilk as what you do and what I do. And what uh, the machines of the future might be able to do when we get there and see what they're capable of doing. So rationalist epistemology in the English tradition, Locke created uh, the baseline for virtually everything that followed in the English language philosophy, his ever cautious sense of the inaccessibility of final answers has been a continued theme. It's always been cautious. What is it that you think you know? And all those continental people over there, my goodness, Edgar, aren't they jumping the gun and reaching wild conclusions based on very little evidence? So we have David... Hume and mind-body dualism in the 18th century. Uh, Locke's empiricism was taken to its logical conclusion, first by Bishop Barclay, uh, the great Irish philosopher, who argued that we can never get past perceptions. He didn't even try to suggest that there was anything beyond the perceptions, causing the perceptions. In his famous um, Nostrum essay as percibi, to be is to be perceived. He's the guy of if the uh, tree falls in the forest, <laughs> you know, what do we know? And then by David Hume, who argued the radical position that even the mind, the thinking entity, was an impression. Empiricism and science have always been closely linked. Locke's epistemology was a natural fit for the development of the scientific method. Hume had pointed out that causes were not directly observable and that we rely really on differing levels of probability. Uh, Hume used the famous analogy of a billiard ball striking other billiard boards and, 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 you know, to the naive mind, you know, the cue ball goes crashing into one of the other billiard balls and it, and to the naive mind, it causes the other ball to ricochet. And, and Hume points out, you didn't see a cause. You did not observe a cause. What you was observed was first the one ball moving contacting the second ball and then the second ball moving. And that indeed, while obviously on a billiard table, since 
if I've struck the ball a million times and I've seen the other ball ricochet away a million times, I'm going to make the assumption that there is a highly probable um, predictability involved in those two events. What we've learned from especially modern physics is, is that, and modern science in general, is that probabilities, wildly different levels of probability um, are what is really the stuff of scientific investigation and conclusion. Look at epidemiological studies and the like. Look at what, what we have learned from the applications of big data, whereby looking at totally non-health related external information, supercomputers analyzing myriads of, of, of so-called big data digitally can predict where there might be outbreaks of, of certain diseases and the like, merely because of other patterns of movement, population movement and, and, and store purchases and the like. Uh, and, and so modern science generally is, is based on arguing for the reliability of certain kinds of probability but it's often up against the fact that you, you never see necessity and you never see causal relationship. Creating standards for scientific verification was a focal point of empirical philosophy. What does it mean for something to be verifiable? Why, why do you recommend social distancing, for instance, with COVID-19 running around? And later periods, various theories of philosophical positivism were outgrowths of this sensibility. So logical positivism and linguistic philosophy developments in 20th century and, and continued in late 19th, well, continued all the way into 21st century uh, philosophical thinking. In the last century or so, analytic philosophy has addressed the question of, of whether language could be reduced to logic. Early in the 20th century, there was an attempt to do this. Logical atomism, as, as, as um, people like Wittgenstein tried to call it at one point. And if not, and the answer was not for the most part, whether philosophy could provide rules for specialized ordinary languages. What do we mean? So, so mo a lot of ling modern linguistic philosophy doesn't try to to ask ultimate epistemological questions of what we can know, they start with what does law language mean when it uses statements like thus and such? And, 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 and so you get philosophers of, of law trying to say, if, if you follow certain general assumptions that are made in legal argument. Here are some ramifications of that. Here are some conclusions that can be drawn of this. Are they ultimate aspects of reality? We're not even trying to attempt that. We're just trying to clarify the use of common language. Attempts to force language into the strict bounds of modal logic, symbolic logic, has even led to a school of common sense philosophy. Um, major names in, in, in this modern tradition, I mean, I could have put 80 names in here, but Bertrand Russell and Rudolf Carnap and Ludwig Wittgenstein and Gilbert Ryle and Willard Quine and John Searle. Uh, there's even a contemporary American philosopher, um, son of a rabbi, Saul Kripke, uh, has used methods, who lives on Long Island now, but grew up in Omaha, I believe, has used methods of modal logic. He's sort of like the preeminent modal logician of the late 21st, late 20th and early 21st centuries, and analytic philosophy to establish a revival of, 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 of what he calls metaphysical statements. So we see some people trying to build back into old philosoph traditional philosophical endeavors using the new techniques. And then the final slide. 
Ah, you have not escaped my animations. Epistemological questions raised in the 17th century. Are we body and mind? Are we a dualism? Or are we a monism? A body that can think, and how does that work? And what are the ramifications of that? Does that mean other bodies can work? Um, what thinks, the brain or the mind? Can we know things in themselves? Can language communicate? Um, it is all it is all a question to be asked. And I'm, uh, if you notice in the chat box, Al has pointed out that a modern treatment of the basis of scientific knowledge, he recommends the book, The Ring of Truth, an inquiry into how we know what we know by Philip Morris. And thank you for that. Um, but here we are uh, in the great modern conundrum. Philosophy has been pulled inside out. Ultimate questions uh, leave us the kinds of questions that, that classical philosophers and medieval philosophers wanted answered. Uh, what can we know about, for sure, about external reality? Uh, What is God? How can we know that? All of these become sort of questions beyond the realm of the, the pragmatic that we lock ourselves into. Uh, anyhow, that is, I just get my image moving again. I'm going to, with that, stop the share. I am going to unpin myself and if you've got observations or questions or whatever I do I do want to remind everybody before uh, I get away from it we aren't we don't need meet next week we skip a week because it is election day and I did want to point out that there is a class next Monday, a lecture I'm giving in the adult school, if anybody's interested. It overlaps with something we did in that, the, that late Roman history class, if people sat in on that, but there, I know there are people who didn't, called Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, Christianity and Late Antiquity. And that's in the adult school um, flyer that you can just find looking up the Montclair Adult School. That said, uh, what observations or questions? I'm, I'm sorry, Lou, I'm, I, I'm gonna, in your class next week, are you gonna cover St. Augustine? Uh, there will be references to him, <laughs> for sure, but uh, it's, it's so broad that it can't be a very close look. Okay. And, but certainly one of the um, relevant dominant, at least two of the relevant dominant uh, so-called uh, heresies of the period were ones that he took up arms against. So he will, he will for sure get mentioned along the way. Okay, thanks. Sorry to be an interrupt. No, no problem. That's what this is about. This was terrific, Lou. Who's that, Richard? No, that was me, Al. Al, thank you for that. Um, I, I hope one of the things I hope everybody takes away from it, though, is, um, or two things, actually. One is that kind of practical instrumentalism that we have all settled for in modern thinking because large questions, the large questions have themselves been called into question and, and, and pushed to the back burner uh, is one. But the other thing is the different styles of continental and Anglo-American thought. And you still see it 
expressed everywhere. And you'll find it in um, very dominant in philosophy departments where there are, if, if one went to Louvain or Heidelberg to study philosophy, as opposed to going to Princeton or the University of Oklahoma to discover, to, to study philosophy, they would be two entirely different enterprises. One would rely on British linguistic uh, and scientific analysis, and the other would 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 rely on on inventive, large questions uh, that proceed from phenomenology and structuralism and all the great rationalist enterprises that were developed on the continent over the last couple of hundred years. And, and styles of thinking are different. I, I love the idea that when European politics gets discussed by Europeans, it has this kind of um, large issue rational debate underlying just the annoying concerns of the moment, whereas Anglo-American political theory always seemed to be about the annoying ideas of the moment. <laughs> and, but we take what we, what we can out of that. Anyhow. Um, Lou, do you think the... Um question about the origin of consciousness will ever be answered satisfactorily? Do I? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I would, you know, the, the people involved, I've read a couple of books on artificial intelligence. The people engaged in, in doing that building computer, you know, neurological model systems, attempting to approach general artificial intelligence from some angle. Um, there are some people who think that in 15 years we could be there and other people playing around with it, say never or a thousand years. Um, are the only options. I don't know. I I doubt that I am in the right generation to have an opinion about that at this point. Um, if we don't destroy ourselves as a planet, three or four generations from now might have reframed the question in a, in a different way that I can't imagine, but I'd like to see what they say about it. That's a fancy way of saying I have a hell of a clue. Anyhow, again, we don't meet next week. I will send the, as I always do, the cumulative PDF of the course up and through the first four. Uh, when they post the uh, YouTube recording, Zoom recording, that's been edited down to just the class itself. Um, I'll send another email notifying that. I'll remind you of when the next class meets in two weeks. Anyhow, this has been fun, um, daunting and fun. See you then. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.